And now something just a little bit different. This time, instead of a specific strategy or tactical aspect or bullet point or whatever, I just want to appreciate this deck that I went up against the other day. <laughs> and it was really incredible because I wasn't expecting it in the slightest. And granted, uh, at this time, like this is right after the ladder reset, so I'm pretty of a pretty high uh, ranking right now. So you, you know, that kind of comes with it. You know, weird, not necessarily meta decks, but also that's kind of where the fun of it is, right? As you get higher and higher, this is a small rant, but as you get higher and higher, you start running to uh, <laughs> start running into you know the meta. As I say, as I net deck, you know, <laughs> that's the strongest decks of the meta right now. Let's just to learn it, just to learn it, and then I'm gonna to switch to something else. But until then, but this game, this tech is gonna take like hundreds of games to really get fully grasped. But anyway, uh, so this is a particularly, I think, interesting deck. And by the way, don't take my gameplay um, as gospel. This is one of the first games I started playing with this particular deck, so a lot of it's gonna be wrong. So don't even bother with that. And also, granted, a lot of the plays that my opponent makes maybe not are the best, but still, the core of the idea of this deck I think is really interesting. So he opens up with the the new, this used to be called Fiend. I don't know what it's called anymore or if it's still called Fiend. Uh, but this is kind of a weird unit. It's a bronze unit that boosts up to 11 from 8 if you have a particular unit in your hand. And I didn't really understand it. It seems relatively weak to me. But at least it doesn't have to row stack. Agility is so great, man. I'm so glad so many more units have agility. It just raises the skill caps by so, so much and allows for so many different strategies. Without having to be necessarily chained down to certain aspects, like um, like having a pair of brigades locked to the melee row was always a pain because you'd always have to worry about Igni. Uh, and it wasn't even just like D bombs or anything like that. It was just annoying stuff like Igni. But anyway, so he makes a little bit of a strange play, and I'm not really going to get too much into the uh, the more technical aspect of what's going on here. He he plays Frightener on my side of the board for an odd reason and then I just kind of hit this and I kill it and it goes back it the only thing I can really think of because you know typically if you're going to play a spy in this fashion it's because you're following up with a lot of tempo or you have a way to basically nullify the advantage that was given over and we go into the round two same card advantage which is really good for me of course so it was a little bit weird that he was doing I think he was he's either hmm. it would make sense for him to try and do what he was trying to do in round two, as you'll see here in a moment. But for him to do it then was a little bit strange. But anyway, so he goes into the second round. He has a very clear game plan that he wants to put in place. And also, I'm also make a little bit of a mistake here. So against, if you're going against like consume monsters or that are using Neckers or in general, like uh, consuming kind of things, it's generally not all that great to try and face them in this round. Or rather, I should say. So I wanted to play cards to try and counter his carryover, right? I want him to play one card. I want us to go to the next round with me being one card up, as opposed to just going to round three, same cards, which would still give me the last say, which I could counter something like Graveyard Hag with. But I was trying to push for a little bit more, which I think is a bit of a mistake, because if just a single Necker survives and he has all these consumes going off, and we go into round three and he still has that one Necker, right? That's come back. Uh, I basically just lose the game because it'll be like, what, a 14, 15 strength bond or something like that. And then I just lose. So it was kind of a bad idea just kind of to fight this. And also in this deck, I have a lot of tools to punish uh, stacking really high, like with Igni or with um, Marigold Tailstorm. So there was really no reason for me to keep playing into this. But regardless, I did. <laughs> I think it was a mistake. But anyway, uh, but I, I kind of tried to remedy it, I think, a little bit here by... I was kind of thinking about using Gaven, but that's obviously not a very good play because it allows him to catch up very quickly to my uh, strength total. He could still probably do it from if I just pass right now and he'd go down one guard, which is basically what I was trying to uh, trying to get. Uh, but I didn't really want to let this 19 strength play go away, so I wanted to play a little bit further into it. Just like so. I'm going to speed this up a little bit because he takes a little while. Whoops. Yep. 
Yeah, there we go. All right. So, yeah. So he gets on and he starts uh, creating a bunch of these neck which I thought was a little bit strange uh, because he's not really in a position to take advantage of that, or so I thought, right? That, that's This is where this deck starts to really get interesting. And obviously, he has to go quite a few cards down just to catch up. Oh, I was going to say, he has to go quite a few cards to go down uh, to pass me right on strength. As it turns out, he definitely does not because he plays this one fiend. He eats one of those 11 strength units he set up in round one, and this is instantly going to go up to 18 strength, and then he boosted this by one, and he beats me by one. Ah, talk about unlucky. That's a really incredibly, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, what? It's an incredibly strong little play that he's got it there by setting up some certain things in round one, which I think is really interesting. Which I suppose is where that quote unquote fiend card, uh, the 11 strength vanilla bronze comes in. It doesn't really do anything, but I guess because there's so much consumed synergy there, not necessarily in like uh, getting a buff of it, but rather to buff other things to have a target. I think that's really interesting and not something that's actually seen a whole lot in any other aspect of the game right now. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. And most things just kind of like buff another thing or they directly set up something else. But rarely it sets it up in such a like a vanilla fashion, which I think is really cool. I like that. That's that's one big aspect of this deck that I like. And also like these incredibly high tempo plays. That he's gonna, it's not that incredibly high right there, this one. Uh, but in general, he's able to just slam down these huge cards, which I think is really cool. And it can make for some really surprising uh, tempo advantages if you're not really used to it. So like if you're playing, uh, you know, neck and neck and then, you know, you kind of decide to pass or something like thinking he's not going to be able to, to surpass it. And then he slams down, you know, 16 worth of strength in one turn off just, a, you know, a regular bronze ghoul unit, which is just incredible. And also, this isn't really... Actually, I need to find out if he if the ghoul eats it, does it banish it? I would imagine it does, but I'm not really sure. Because if it banishes it, then you have anti synergy with your grave hag. Well, and then this is kind of this is okay. I I said I wasn't gonna really go into like more technical aspect, but also this is really interesting. So previously in the past, right? So this is this is the vod review part. Before it was just cool deck part, but this is the vod review part. All right. So this 39 strength gold unit, right? Wow, it's pretty incredible. 39 strength, untouchable, right? Wrong. Gold immunity patch hit, and it made it so that this 39 strength, this 39 strength is incredibly vulnerable from things like uh, I'm pretty sure Succubus probably hits that by now. It almost certainly hits gold units. Uh things like Igni, of course, is going to, as you'll see later, completely annihilate that. And then other things like uh Marigold's Hailstorm is gonna cut that in half. I mean, does Coral does Coral count against gold units that could just remove 38 strength in one turn? So I think this is a really interesting fundamental difference the way you think about consume monsters. Previously, if you played consume monsters before, you know you used uh, the Unseen Elder to devour some of your... It would be one, to set, set up synergies, and then two, to devour your big units so that they were safe. And this was especially powerful in like round three scenarios where... Players would generally save their removal for as long as possible or, or disruption effects in general because they want to get the most value out of them. And so by unseen eldering them, you protected them and you had this very sturdy gold body that was untouchable. And it was very also very effective against things like uh, Axemen because they wouldn't be able to get their uh, hits off on a gold body, right? Unless they had something like a, a Shackles, but that wasn't really a thing. Uh, so, But now, because of the gold immunity change, this person... I don't want to like disparage them or anything, but you know, you have to keep in mind, like with that, such a ginormous change on this deck that you can't play it the same way anymore. You cannot just devour your biggest units because that is a lightning rod for like so many effects that can just like cut it in half, remove it entirely, steal it. And it's just like, and just alone it's just a really big target for you to hit anything with like all kinds of removal uh, regular disruption effects with you know just like doing three or five damage all uh all in a single target and then scorch scorch is another big one that's being used oh it's just it's so like you cannot use it to just try to get a big gold body that doesn't work anymore and it's actually kind of surprising i actually am not I'm not that okay with that. I think maybe they should introduce a tag, like an immune tag, that makes it immune 
which would basically do what the old gold affected, but it'd only be on very select units like uh off the top of my head. Um like Unseed Elder and then cards like uh maybe like Tibor or the the Skellige 14 strength guy you get spot five ten. The cards like that that are like they were typically they were very powerful before. And this is where I want to pause it. Ah, I gotta pause on it. Uh, they were powerful before because they were such big gold bodies that were very difficult to deal with. And a lot of their value actually came out of just being a big gold body, not necessarily out of the value they brought. Now that the gold immunity changes in place, they didn't really get buffs to compensate uh, compensate for it, at least not very much. And I think something needs to be done maybe because it can't just be armor. Like if you just put armor, I guess that could work for something like Tibor or... No, because even then, because it jumps up to... Such an absurdly high strength, and it just becomes a lightning run. So it like loses so much worth. In that sense, you would have to only use it like as a last card finisher, which I think is not very good. Going tall strategies are very are very easily punished. But they did change the Igni to be 25, and both of those two cards I mentioned previously avoid that. So maybe it's not that big of a problem. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm making too big of a deal of it. But I wouldn't be surprised if they ended up adding an immune tag to cards like Unseen Elder. So you could still use that strategy. Because I think it's a good strategy. I really like that strategy where you could... Because uh, the, the leader itself isn't all that powerful. Like It's like 5 strength or something like that. That's pretty, that's pretty weak. And then its only effect is to consume something. So if you're not actually getting a direct consume synergy off, then you're really just doing nothing. You're just, you're just planting a 5 strength gold uh, lightning rod on the board. And generally speaking, you want your units to be spread out a little bit. Uh... Not too much, of course, but a little bit. And to just consolidate all, to, you know, push it all onto one unit, it's just not good. It's it's like terrible. It's, it's awful. You would never want to do that. Uh, I don't know. It's weird. I didn't really think of it much at the time, but now that I'm really thinking about it, it is Consume Elder just unplayable unless you strictly go for Consumed Energies, like uh, Devouring Egg or something. But even that's not even that good or even reliable. Hmm. I have no answer, but food for thought. But really, the, okay, so that's the VOD review part. Back to the cool deck synergy part. So this guy, he set up a whole bunch of deck necros, right? And then he got a, um, and then he set up some consumes so he could get these necros up to be something like 9 and 8 strength, whatever, right? So he uses these ogres. I haven't actually explored this card very much. I'm actually just seeing this for the first time within this game, and then kind of forgot about it. So basically what he's doing is that he's, I'm pretty sure it works like this. So he plays the ogre, it goes up to seven strength, and then he hits his own unit for nine, right? And then he uses that nine strength and he carries it over something else. Normally that wouldn't be that great, but because he has a necker that comes right back in, his tempo is just going out of control. It's so cool. <laughs> it's a strategy that's not really going to work <laughs> in the long run because necker is one or counterable and two. Um, you need to have a target that can even take on that nine damage. And also you need to have your Neckers uh, have enough consumes energy already. And also setting up all that. It's just, it's a real big pain. But I think in this particular instance, I was really amazed by it because it was like, what, uh, 10, you're basically doing 19. Yeah, 19 worth of uh, strength advantage on just a bronze card. And you're basically having no downside because you had the, all these Neckers in, in the back of your deck. In addition, like if you have a big necker going into round two and then you have it going back into round three, it's just synergy, synergy, synergy. So I think it was really cool. So he plays the succubus. Uh, I was initially kind of like, what? Why is it on his side? Because obviously I didn't, or not obviously, but I didn't really look at the changes. So I'm kind of discovering this as I go. Uh, <laughs> and I thought it was really interesting because I was on his side and I was like, oh, that's weird, right? But then I read the text. Oh, it will steal the, the, the highest unit on the opposite side of the board. So in exchange for losing its gold immune status, which was pretty powerful, and the only way to stop it previously was to move a unit or shackles. Now it just kind of goes off. Uh, in, or rather, in exchange for that gold immunity, now it stays on your side of the board. So it's only a positive, or it's only... There's not that big of an associated risk, because before you would give your opponent five strength, now you get to keep that five strength. And also you can buff it yourself with a, it can be a unit for being buffed rather for potions and the like, and obviously save my soul, uh, save my Zoltan. I didn't actually expect this to come out, but I saved Zoltan anyway. and was able to move my unit out of danger. Good stuff.
And really, that's also kind of like a minor point, but I, did, I had no reason to use old 10 before. And when the opportunity finally arrived that I could use it for something, uh, which actually won me the game, feels pretty good. Because it would have been 46. Yeah, I would have lost by like 9. So if I had not had saved Zoltan for that very last moment, I actually would have lost this game, despite going into this round like 4 cards ahead, 3 cards ahead. No, actually it was less than that. It was like 2, two cards ahead or something like that. But anyway. So even though I have a commander stone at my 15 strength, it was still really close because he, if he had stolen that 46 strength unit, I would have lost anyway. So I saved my very flexible unit. Uh, even if I wasn't expecting something, I still saved a flexible unit for the very end. And in general, I probably would have used. I'd like to think I would have used commander Horn at first and then Dalton, but who knows? I actually probably would use commander Horn, but now I'm going to be keeping that in mind. I should be watching out for su enemy succubuses. This is a bit of a longer uh, this is a bit of a longer video to cover both the, this cool deck that I'm actually rel relatively interested in trying. It's a, I think it looks like a fun gimmick deck, but otherwise some good VOD viewpoints in there. For example, planting that seed of doubt of it is unseen elder garbage because he is no longer a stable gold body. Does he need armor? Does he need some kind of immunity? Who knows? Something to think about. Thanks for watching.